the first thing that we're going to talk about here is um, if you look in the upper left hand corner, I like to ask the question, when I think I have a bright idea, or if others think they have a bright idea, they often come into my office and they say, Scott, what do you think about this idea? And I say, I don't have a clue, because I'm not an expert in everything. Um, I know how to build businesses, but I'm not an expert in what you're talking about. This is like taking the Tootsie Roll, you know, and licking it three times to see, you know, how many times it gets to, you know, it takes to get to the middle. You got to test it and you got to find out. So the very first thing that I want to do is I want to find out what's available today. Why? Because I don't want to kid myself. I want to know if I have something that's original. And so I'm going to lay out side by side all the solutions that exist in the area that I think is a good idea. And then I'm going to say to myself, well, where are the holes? Because those are the opportunity, the gaps in service, uh, uh, and the problems that you've observed with current, present solutions, those are where the opportunities exist. And so I'm going to take a look at what's available today. I'm going to identify the holes. And then over here, you can see I'm going to develop my list of hypotheses, the things that I think are true. And note that I think they are true. So let me give you an example. Uh, years ago, I founded a company called APU Solutions. It brings together the supply chain of the property casualty insurance companies, the collision repair shops, and the salvage recyclers to bring efficiencies for procuring altern alternative parts to repair vehicles for the insurance industry. So it was a great idea, um, so we thought. And um, as we're thinking about uh, uh, what, we're, what we're going to do, uh, and we build out this solution, we find out that it's going to take six years for the whole industry to go wireless, but we decide that we're going to be patient and do it. And so we're patient, and 12 years later, we have a nice exit. Everybody was happy. There was a lot of hard work along the way. But in the middle of all that, I said, all right, now we have this beautiful technology that we've built. We have this incredible supply chain. It's the best on the planet. So why aren't we taking this solution to, um, why aren't we taking it to the consumer market? We have the enterprise market taken care of. Why don't we take it to the consumer market? Because I already have this fantastic edge on all my competitors because I have this incredible technology. But as we took it through business model development and customer validation, I realized why my partners had decided not to look at uh, the, uh, the, the uh, consumer market. It was just fraught with too many difficulties, too much pain, too much uncertainty, and so we kicked it to the curb. And we were happy to kick it to the curb because now we could focus on something else. Um, so we take these hypotheses, which we think are true, and we begin to test them one by one by one. And this is just the model itself. Okay. Right now, we're just talking about the model itself whether or not the dogs will eat the dog food. We just want to see if somebody else is really interested in this. So notice over here, <coughs> as we begin to test uh, with our, our model, we, we test and we learn and then we pivot and then we iterate and we follow that same cycle until we have so many customers interested in what we're doing, they're ready to write us checks. Now that's real validation, right? So a lot of the questions that people want to ask then um, about this process of testing, learning, pivoting, and iterating is how exactly do we do that? And there's sort of three methodologies that are used today. Because we don't want to fool ourselves. We don't want to have anecdotal uh, uh, validation. We want to have real validation that is proven out by customers. And so there's sort of three methodologies that we use. And the first one is the, by far the most important, and it's the hardest. It's sitting down with real customers and remembering you know, from Paul and Nathan's book that customers do not innovate, but they do validate. They don't innovate, but they do validate. So that's exactly what Niall was saying also. That's why you can't go to people and say, what do you think, uh, or, or what, tell me about your problems, because they oftentimes really don't know what their problems are. That's up to you guys, the innovators, to think about that. 
um, and, and through that observation process. So customer interviews, face to face, you have well developed, well thought through um, questions. And remember, if you don't ask the right question, you probably won't get the right answer. Just like in a political, you know, if you were if you were look uh, if you were looking at what they do as they do these surveys in the for the Republicans and Democrats and political races, you can you can kind of twist it any way that you want. Uh, but if you want to get to the truth when it comes to um, validating, we want to ask the right question in the right way so that we get to the truth. I want the truth because I don't want to be misled. So I might do 30 of those interviews or more. And then I might do a couple or three or four focus groups correctly done, because there's a lot of them that are incorrectly done. Therefore, you won't get the right information. And then I can actually send out surveys with correctly worded questions using SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics or others. And you can send it out to your target audience, the people that you think are your customers. And you can do a couple hundred of those. But it is the synthesis of that information that matters. It's getting the amalgamation, putting it all together, and then you can make good decisions about whether or not you have real validation. All right. But once you've validated the model, that is insufficient because you have no idea um, if whatever it takes to you know, develop this particular key uh, um, starter, electronic starter. So let's say that uh, this thing costs $2,000. How practical would it be? Would you rather have that $2,000 uh, or would you rather have a key? So you'd rather spend $2,000? I mean, at some point, it becomes you know, too, uh, too expensive for people, and they just won't buy it, because there isn't sufficient value created in the mind of the, or, or, or the ability. Even if they think that there's enough value there, they just don't have the ability to pay for it. So how successful will you be if it's too expensive? So you're also going to test out your pricing and your revenue streams. Pricing, because you, you've got to know your distribution channel. You may have to sell through wholesalers who then sell through distributors before you ever get into stores. And then, you know, do you have enough money from manufacturing all the way to the end of the supply chain to make it a profitable and interesting venture for everybody concerned? Okay? So then you'll have to test out your revenue streams, your market channels, your customer segments. And by knowing all of these things, only then can you develop your go-to-market strategy. Uh, for example, I uh, worked with a customer, uh, not this last summer, the summer before, all summer long. And they were wanting to understand how to go to market. And I said, let's find out. So let's do a test. And we're going to take your sales, guys, and we're going to take a month. And we're going to work on large customers, medium customers, and small customers. And we're going to uh, find out what the... Um, um, how many calls that we've got to make uh, before the, the average number of calls before somebody decides that they're going to buy. We want to learn, is it different for big customers versus small customers versus medium-sized customers? So at the end of the test, uh, they determined that the call cycle or decision cycle was just as, was exactly the same for small customers as it was for big customers. So what do you think the decision was of the group? Okay, go to the big customers. Why? I have a limited amount of money. I have a limited number of salespeople. So I want to get the biggest bang for my buck. And given it's going to take me the same effort to get big customers as small customers, I'm going to work first with big customers, generate more revenue, give me more money to be able to go to the rest of the market. Make sense? All right. So um, let's. Um, one of the things I also want to talk about here on, before I go away through the slide, people have an awfully hard time telling people what it is that they want to do. For example, people would say, tell me about APU solutions. And so I had an elevator pitch. It was really easy. Well, APU, it brings together the supply chain of the property casualty insurance companies, the collision repair shops, and the salvage recyclers to bring efficiencies for procuring alternative parts uh, for the insurance industry when they elect to repair vehicles instead of 
uh, totaling the car. And you know what? I found out that you didn't have to be very smart or very informed about the industry in order to get what we were doing. But this same group that I was telling you about, okay, a couple summers ago, when I asked them, tell me about your business model and what it is that you do, you know what? I was with them for about three hours before I finally understood exactly what it was that they were trying to do. Now, how do you suppose you're going to sell anybody when you can't articulate what it is that you do, the value proposition, so that, as I like to say, fifth graders or seventh graders can get it and comprehend it and understand it and say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So um, by, doing, by going through this whole process of what's available today and what the holes are, that becomes actually the basis for your sales pitch. Because you're going to walk through that one by one by one by one to each of those uh, gaps in service, and you're going to say, look how my solution solves that pain. All right, let's go uh, to the next slide, and we're going to close this off. A lot of people look at this uh, uh, business model canvas, and they get a little bit freaked out by it. But it's really very, very simple, and we've talked about most of it just on the last slide. But this slide will be available for you to take a look at. It'll be a little bit easier for you to follow. So look at it as we say, well, who are our key partners, and why does that matter? So we say, well, manufacturers, suppliers, distributors, channel partners, strategic partners, outsourcing. It allows us to really think through how our product goes to market and who we're involved with in that process. And that's part of defining who the key partners are. And what are the key activities? Do we have to design something? Are we building some software? You know, what is the architecture going to look like? Um, do we even know what platform we're going to build it on and why? And you can go through the rest of those of supply chain management, platforms, problem solving, you know, sales. These are the key activities that you define as young entrepreneurs, and, and why are we doing this too? The reason is because, as Paul pointed out, 90% of businesses have failed in the past. And why is it that they failed? Is it because they didn't have enough money? And the answer is no. They failed because they didn't have enough know-how. And so the way to get the know-how is to be able to have mentors and to be able to take it through a formal process that you can understand, that you can comprehend. It's not some you know, 26 step MIT, Harvard, whatever you want to name it, you know, com complicated, convoluted methodology. It's really easy. We form an idea. You know, we test it and validate it. We go through business model development. We go through the launch. And there's a particular number of things you do during the launch. And then we scale it once we have nailed uh, the pain and, be, and, and done the early launch. Well, we can go through the rest of these. And I'm not going to take the time to go through each one of them today because you have the slide. You're going to have it, and you'll be able to refer back to it. But you need to use this inside of your presentation. Guys, if you can't communicate your ideas, if you can't communicate how you've been able to uh, create value, how you've validated what you've done, if you can't do that, you won't succeed in this competition. This is why we talk about sequencing, OK? You don't uh, um, start with the idea over here and end with this finished product over here and forget everything in between. It's about building blocks. Okay, and you can't take anything out of order because if you take anything out of order, guess what? People have questions. And once they have questions, they stop listening to you. Even if you said it, you don't get credit for it. Even if you validated it, you don't get credit for it. So you have to have a presentation that's worthy of all the work and energy that you're putting into this competition. Now, the outcome of this is, frankly, that you'll build a business. And you'll build a successful business. And we had a lot of them on campus last year because they followed this process. And we're not talking about small businesses. We're talking about businesses that have the potential to be tens and tens of millions in revenue. And that's going to make them very valuable companies and able to change the world and to do things that uh, are important for themselves and others throughout the course of their lives. 
So I want you to take the opportunity to understand the business model canvas. And when you first go through the canvas, you're going to take all of your assumptions. Go back to the other slide. So we have all of these hypotheses right over here, right? And we have these hypothe hypotheses that we have set up for pricing and, and in our revenue streams and our market channels and so forth. Let's go back to the other slide now. And these are all located on this canvas. It's a way of mapping and helping to make sure that you didn't forget something important. But just because you could put it up there, just because you could think it is true, doesn't mean it's true. So you'll have to test every one of those. And when you see the successful ones that have gone through, what you find is that they had numerous iterative processes or, or canvases that they had gone through before they finally got with the one where they said, this is fully validated. Everything on this sheet of paper is validated. There's no guesswork. We have gone through it meticulously. And by the way, it doesn't take two hours to watch 60 minutes. This does not take a long time. This can be done in two months or three months. You don't have to take years to do this sort of thing.